day my ladies and good thing you're here. That's because here at what I like to call menopause university, <laughs> you learn everything you need to know in order to manage your menopause successfully and avoid the things you don't want. Of course, you also learn how to get the things you do want, but since we're embarking on a unit on cervical cancer and it's one of the things you don't want, I mentioned the don't wants first. So here we are at video number 346. Last week we discussed the screening tests for cervical cancer, which is the popular pap smear. The pap smear has been around for about as long as most of us can remember. We've been getting them annually throughout most of our adult lives. But in the year 2008, the actual cause of cervical cancer was discovered and that discovery has brought with it new considerations. So today I'll teach you about the cause of cervical cancer. Now, as thorough as my book is, it does not cover cervical cancer. So you need to watch the videos in this YouTube unit to get this information. So let's begin with a review to set the stage for our discussion today. It's really just a good way to orient you to the topic at hand. George Papanicolau <laughs> discovered that the pap smear could detect abnormal cervical cells long before they became cancerous, and that made the pap smear an ideal screening test for cervical cancer. And that's because the aim of a screening test is to detect a cancer before it becomes clinically evident or produces symptoms, and the pap smear did just that. But believe it or not, all of this was possible before the actual cause of cervical cancer was even known. It wasn't until 2008 that a man by the name of Harold Zerhausen discovered the actual cause of cervical cancer. Zerhausen was a man who obtained a medical degree but decided to pursue research rather than clinical medicine. And in his research, he focused on viruses that caused diseases, particularly cancers. Oncoviruses are viruses that cause cancers. And Zerhausen discovered that one particular virus was the cause of cervical cancer. It was the human papilloma virus, or HPV. Now, HPV is a ubiquitous virus. That means it's everywhere. It's actually difficult to avoid it. There are over 100 different kinds of HPV. 90% of HPV infections cause no symptoms or diseases at all. But the majority of people are most familiar with the HPV viruses we're discussing here today, which are transmitted by sexual contact with an infected individual. The problem is that the infected person doesn't know he or she is infected. And that's why HPV is so common. The people who are spreading it have no idea they're spreading it. And if you get HPV, you won't know it for decades. So don't assume that your current sex partner gave it to you. Blame your sex partner from about 20 years ago or so. <laughs> for 90% of HPV exposures, the virus resolves spontaneously within a year or two and you never even know you had it. And only certain kinds of HPV are transmitted by sexual contact. And these sexually transmitted types of HPV can affect your cervix, your vagina, your vulva, your anus, your mouth, or your throat. If HPV persists in your external genital region, it can cause genital warts. Genital warts are fleshy growths of tissue that resemble fleshy moles. But unlike moles, genital warts are not darker than the surrounding skin. They actually look a lot like cauliflower. Here's a photo of warts caused by HPV. Tell me if you think they look like cauliflower. Pretty similar, aren't they? You can get 
warts from HPV on just about any part of your body. Some people get them on their hands and they can be flat or raised. The raised ones are the ones that look most like cock flower. And different types of HPV cause different diseases. And in medicine, instead of using the term different types, we say different strains. You can think of strains as being like members of an extended family. There are over 100 strains of HPV. Fortunately, instead of designating them by name, we use numbers. <laughs> That's a lot easier in terms of knowing which strains cause which diseases. <laughs> The strains that infect your genital organs are typically oncogenic, which means they cause cancer. And Dr. Zerhausen discovered that only certain strains of HPV caused cervical cancer. He discovered that the transformation zone, also called the squamo-columnar junction, is very susceptible to infection with two particular strains of HPV, HPV-16 and HPV-18. 70% of cervical cancers are caused by these two strains alone, with HPV-16 causing 50% of them. But other strains of HPV also cause the majority of the remaining 30% of cervical cancers. All told, almost 99% of cervical cancers are caused by HPV. Now, HPV 6 and 11 are the typical cause of the genital warts that look like cauliflower. So these Different strains of HPV have different targets and they cause different problems. The bottom line is that there are four strains of HPV that are pertinent to your genitalia. 6, 11, 16, and 18. And of these, two of them are especially responsible for cervical cancer. 16 and 18. Now, in video number 341, you learned about the risk factors for cervical cancer. Here's the long list of risk factors. Young age, young age at first intercourse, more than one sexual partner, history of a sexually transmitted disease, many pregnancies, cigarette smoking, chronic immune suppression, DES or diethylstilbestrol exposure, history of an abnormal pap smear, infrequent pap smears, and living in an underdeveloped country. But in this tutorial, you've discovered that this whole list of risk factors really boils down to primarily one thing that actually causes cervical cancer infection with the human papillomavirus. It just so happens that everything on the list of risk factors increases your likelihood of exposure to an infection with HPV. The first five risk factors have to do with a sex life that puts you at greater risk of HPV exposure. Young age, young age at first intercourse, more than one sexual partner, history of a sexually transmitted disease, and many pregnancies. The next three risk factors have to do with an immune system that is more likely to result in infection once you've been exposed to HPV, cigarette smoking, chronic immune suppression, and DES exposure. And the last three have to do with failure to diagnose HPV early enough to impair its ability to cause the cells of your cervix to transform into cervical cancer history of an abnormal pap smear, infrequent pap smears, and living in an underdeveloped country. So the lesson here is that risk factors sometimes only hint at the real underlying cause of a cancer. Not one of these risk factors is a true cause of cervical cancer. Instead, they are all just setups 
for either exposure to, infection with, or failure to diagnose HPV. So when you know the actual cause of a cancer, it trumps everything else in terms of risk factors. And cervical cancer is one of the few cancers for which we have such a clear cut, undeniable cause. And yet, there are still a few cervical cancers that are not due to HPV. Now, the interesting thing about all of this is the fact that the screening test for cervical cancer came before the cause of cervical cancer was ever known. We got the screen before the cause. That's a bit like getting the cart before the horse. Yeah, cart before the horse. This is backward. You know, it's got, we, got, we got it the other way around. The way we've done it is this. The cart came first and the horse followed. It doesn't commonly happen that way. Normally we discover the cause of a cancer before we develop a screening test for it. In most cases, knowing the cause is what makes it possible to develop a screening test. So the historical order of events for cervical cancer really did constitute putting the cart before the horse. But having a screening test for cervical cancer and knowing the cause of cervical cancer are both great things. It's just that when they happen in the wrong order, it sometimes throws a wrench into the system. And that's what has happened in the case of cervical cancer. So next week, I'll tell you all about how this discovery of HPV as a cause of cervical cancer has started changing a lot of things about how we screen for it. Your summary for today is this. The vast majority of cervical cancer is caused by the human papilloma virus, in particular, strains 16 and 18. That's really about it. <laughs> I guess this video could have been just three seconds in duration. <laughs> Be sure to go to menopausetaylor.me to schedule a consultation with me. I assure you that it's a life changing experience. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram if you like. Other than that, be sure to subscribe and get everyone you know to do the same. Sign yourself and everyone else up for my newsletter too. And I will see you in a week. <laughs> Bye!